Yeah, I should be. Alrighty, I'll go live now, then. Alright, so we are now live. So, um, today we're doing the um, anarcho-capitalism versus nationalism, I believe, was your primary ideology of choice, right? Uh, yeah, I, I would describe myself as a nationalist before anything else. All right, um, do you have any sort of um, opener you want to go through, or do you want to just uh, head right into it? Uh, let's just go into it. Feel free to take the lead. All right, um, so what exactly does nationalism mean uh, to you, specifically? Uh, as an American, I don't really care for the uh, ethnic definition or a religious definition so much as it's the interests of my nation in this case it's the united states uh hopefully with uh, the aim of keeping our self-governance over our land and that we should govern ourselves free from outside interference that we should have a social contract that is not only maintained but continually refreshed to promote the interests of our people and that we should either uh, maintain or uh, try to conserve our culture and our common values that allow us to be a congruent people. Uh, so you said there that you're looking for, um, you know, uh, the aim of keeping self-governance. But I mean, um, what is self-governance if not anarchy? Uh, is it not surely other people governing you if you're in a state? Uh, you can make that argument in the case of idealism but i think that when it comes down to it having like no common law whatsoever would be pretty detrimental to most people and that more likely than not that would create a power vacuum that would lead to undesirable situations like has happened during a lot of chaotic times in human history so while ideally you know supposedly you you could make the case for no governance whatsoever by any people uh in practice i think that a certain degree of compromise must be made to protect our interests and actually ensure that uh, basic human rights are acknowledged and protected so um you know going over human rights um what are human rights I don't think that there are anything inherent so much as there are things that we've mutually agreed upon. Uh, for example, you have a human right to your uh, to your bodily autonomy. You have your freedom of speech. You have your freedom of religion, uh, freedom of movement, and ever assorted things that would go in line with that, such as the freedom to protect yourself. You have. Uh, similar things that split off from that but are often covered in the uh amendments of the american constitution and the bill of rights so uh something like bodily autonomy and uh, let's say in the case of rape that is surely somebody not agreeing upon your bodily autonomy right uh, definitely right uh but i mean if human rights are things that we agree on and not inherent things and the case of a rape would be somebody not agreeing on your bodily autonomy what makes that a right uh, it's a thing that we've agreed upon as a society. But I mean, at least the rape, at least the rapist uh, doesn't agree call. upon it, right? Well, the rapist may or may not agree with that. Uh, the motive for rape is usually something to do with a uh, sexual desire, as far as I but, know. I mean, they definitely then, don't agree that you should have that bodily autonomy, or else they wouldn't do the rape, right? I, I don't know that for certain because a lot of people I mean, say if they, that if they, smokers if, agree that smoking is bad, but they still do it. No, if they if they thought that that person ought to have that bodily autonomy, then they wouldn't controvert that, right? Surely. But you're basing this on the idea that people always do what they believe in, which uh, I, I don't know about you, but I don't find that to be the case. People often... So what if rapists they who go against what they believe in? What, what if what if a rapist not, had the consistent. what if the rapist had a defense? Well, no, I thought that they shouldn't have that bodily autonomy. You know, what if that was their defense? So therefore, because not everybody agreed on that bodily autonomy, therefore it wasn't a right. That would be them being a dissident to the common understanding of what is. But your, but your definition of what a right was, was things that we agree upon. It's not like a, you know, a one-to-one -one basis so much as it's 
you know, as a nation state or as a collective. I mean, the collective can't want anything. So, I mean, are you going through, like, if the majority want this to be a right, then it's a right? Uh, that's a little bit too much of a black and white. Like, oh, you, you can't say that 51% of people agree with something, therefore it's now a right. Uh, but uh, it's it's based upon the idea. And then in practice, more often than not, you have these political institutions that are set up to uphold current rights. And then you have a very rigorous process to actually change with the times, like, uh, say, with the invention of the Internet, a lot of laws were put into place saying, oh, uh, the distribution of uh, things that you don't own, that probably shouldn't be happening. And so a lot of institutions were put into place that were so, aimed to actually protect those rights and uh, shut down people who were not abiding by the common policies that were enacted. So it's when the political institutions say that it's a right that it becomes a right. In, in practice, this is what it's become. In an ideal society, maybe it would be just sort of, you know, something we all understood because we all shared... But you know, I mean, uh, under under your but, under no. what you are saying, because I mean, what are you saying a right is is the question. So it is. What well, are are you saying that it is whatever the political institutions say is a right is a right? In, in practice, this is how it works for all intents and purposes. All right. We have so, the United Nations. Which, um, what if we all... had a country like I don't know Germany, who said that Jews don't have rights, so therefore we're allowed to kill Jews en masse. That's pretty horrifying. Uh, but would that be a but, valid defense, surely? Because, I mean, they, they, they said they were the political institution at the time. They said that Jews don't have rights. So what makes that an invalid defense? The idea that they're infringing upon the rights that were previously, you know, upheld uh, is making it so the German state in that case was being hypocritical. They went from, oh, everyone uh you know has all these basic things and then they went ahead and decided that certain people just didn't deserve to have those rights without them doing anything wrong you know you, you can't decide by birth oh i'm i'm jewish or oh i'm white or whatever uh that was them being just flat up oh it's discrimination so uh, which is if pretty barbaric what if they had never upheld the rights of Jews? What if from the beginning of time, the German state had always oppressed Jews, never saw them as having rights under the law? Would that make it all right to commit the Holocaust? It wouldn't make it right, but in that case, they wouldn't have On, been on what grounds wouldn't it make it right? The basic common understanding of everyone who actually, uh, you know, belongs to those communities. I mean, it's not the common understanding of everybody, because, I mean, they had the political power. There are definitely in, in people that, who wanted in, the Jews to die. In that hypothetical, uh, based upon what I just said, then, in that case, uh, according to the nationalist perspective, suddenly it's justifiable, but obviously, uh, in the personal perspective... Right, so it, it's, it seems like didn't... nationalism is flawed here, surely, if it's justificatory of the Holocaust. In... A hypothetical that you just said it would have I mean, been. this isn't even a hypothetical. This happened, right? Uh, the Holocaust wasn't done based on nationalistic principles or anything. I though. mean, but it was uh, it, was it was justified under nationalistic principles because on the Nuremberg trials, uh, the German defense was that, well, under German law, Jews had no rights, so there was no rights infringement inherent in the Holocaust. Ergo, uh, we did nothing wrong. But then the uh, prosecution stepped up the stand and they were like, well, no, there is a law which is higher than the German law, and that law says you're not allowed to murder people. I happen to agree with the prosecution at the, Ger at the Nuremberg trials. Uh, do you agree with the defense at the Nuremberg trials? I don't necessarily agree with the process because, again, they went from... I mean, which, which these... side do you agree with? Do you agree with the defense of the Nuremberg trials or the prosecution? I don't fully agree with either side because both of them are things that I partially disagree with. On one hand, okay. So, what was um, wrong about the attack against? I mean, it has to be either one or the other. It has to be you either agree with the defense's point that, well, under German law, 
they didn't have rights, or you have to agree with the prosecution's point that, well, no, there are rights inherent that the German law can't supersede. So which side do you agree with? Again, I don't agree with either of the parties in that case because there are certain things about their actions that were either based in hypocrisy or something that I just fundamentally disagree with. I don't think that there should be any higher law than a nation's law, and I also think that the German state wasn't justified in repealing the rights of the Jews, which were But why, why were they... So they were going against the principles that their nation was built upon. So, I mean, can states they never change in bad faith. Uh, these positive rights, as we can call them? Can they? Are they not think... allowed to change them ever? Well, they can, they can make amendments and they can... Okay, but that would, that would be making a change to these... They can recognize new but things, that would, that but would, that would be making a change to the rights, surely. There, there's a difference between making amendment or recognizing in uh, expanding is... rights and repealing them. And so they can only expand them. rights. That seems like a more reasonable affair. What if uh, instead they framed it as, well, no, we're expanding the German people's right to uh, kill Jews? What if they said that? that? That would infringe upon the previously recognized rights of bodily autonomy right uh, so uh let's let's take this all the way down in nature there is the right to have uh you know non-aggression what about that are we are we at non-aggression now i don't think that non-aggression has ever been recognized and in practice we heavily uh you know prosecute that but we've never gone ahead and said Oh, uh, you can't be aggressive to another people, whether through violence or economic means or what have you. Um, are you familiar with... Um, actually, I won't go to that right now. I'll just go for... Um, do you support an ethic of slavery or one of self-ownership? Self-ownership? Mm -hmm. So, like, do I own myself or do you think other people should own me? You own yourself and no one else should own you. Right, so that would be self-ownership. So therefore, you know, uh, ooh, uh, I would be allowed to put whatever drug I want into my body, right? That's fine. Right, okay. So, um, you know, and the state wouldn't be able to stop me if I, um, you know, if I wanted to keep my money and I didn't want to give it to them in taxes. Or if I wanted to build a nice uh, new bazooka for myself. I don't, agree I don't disagree with any of those things in particular, no. Okay, I mean, this is sounding pretty anarchist. I'm not gonna lie. I have a very libertarian leaning, but I mean, this is this uh, is indefinite controversy to uh, your statements earlier. You can agree that a state should have function, and you can also disagree with I mean, the, then, the means by then, which a state collects funds. What is the state's function then? Uh. It's a mixture of making a sort of common ground for everyone to live in relative harmony, as well as a uh, bulwark of environmentalism and a couple other things. But I mean, what exactly would it do uh, in making this common ground? What what actual powers ought it have? The power of the court system, uh, as well as having a parliament or the presidency or other similar institutions that uh, people vote upon for their electorate, and then they go ahead and have these representatives act in their will, whether it be to create social policies, welfare, or what have you that is either agreed upon or the people who have been elected to represent the people uh, go ahead and do on behalf of the people. And then if they ever go ahead and, you know, go too far, well, that can be repealed, that can be stopped by other elements of the government, or you can remove the people from power, either through political or non-political means, and then you can undo their actions. So, uh, you know, they would have some sort of monopoly over arbitration, then. Is that what you're saying there? Yes. Right, so what if I wanted to, you know, through my self-ownership, I wanted to arbitrate outside of the state? Would I be allowed to do that? I think that in most cases you should be able to, but right, but then that's there are obviously monopoly, some though. cases in which you shouldn't be able to oh. just go ahead and leave the state to escape consequences for your actions, for example. So in which cases should I be disallowed 
from arbitrating outside the state monopoly. If you are, for example, committing an act of violence in the state, then you shouldn't be able to just flee the state. Or if you go ahead and, uh, you know, you commit, uh, you know, an act of terrorism, or if you go ahead and you destroy someone's property or what have you, then you shouldn't but be able to just why couldn't not these, Why couldn't up. these be arbitrated through third parties outside of the state? Why does the state have to be the third party? Because the common ground is based upon the state's existence rather than based upon, oh, uh, oh, we, we all belong to the same religion, or oh, we all belong to the same tribe, or what have you. It's a common expectation uh, alongside the common institutions that protect those. But, I mean, this is a presupposition. Uh, you're, you're assuming that we're both commonly assuming the state as the supreme arbitrator, but we might not. What if I have a dispute with you, and we don't want to go through the state? What happens then? So you're saying if both parties agree? No, no, I'm saying that both, yeah, both parties agree to go to an arbitrator, which isn't the state. Why does the state need that, to be involved here? Why can't it just oh, be free market that, arbitration? In the case that both parties agree that they don't need to bring the state into it, as long as they're not violating anyone else's rights, then that's fine. Right, okay, I mean, that's that's pretty anarchist. So, I mean, you know, there isn't even a monopoly on uh, arbitration in that case. Um, but you said before yeah. that, they, you know, the state could maybe implement policies, like you mentioned welfare there. Uh, how do you think these um, policies would be funded? Through things like inflation. I mean, um, so is this how is this inflation going to fund the state? Are they going to force people to use their money, or are they just going to hope that people use their money? Well, it's more about mutual benefit with having a universal currency than, oh, uh, we're holding you at gunpoint and saying, use our money. Uh, a, a, an institution can go ahead and say that their money is the only one that's, uh, you know, usable to pay taxes with. So in that case, taxes, uh, even though I disagree with taxes and think that they uh, aren't really a fair method of making currency if it's something that we're working around, then it's reasonable of a state to say that only their tender can be used to pay taxes. You can't go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to pay you in a cow or whatever. So, I mean, why would you expect the state's currency to be the universally accepted currency and why not something like gold? Uh, gold as a resource has various limitations like the weight of it. As well I mean, as everything has weight. Aside to from it. having uses and things like, well, the sheer weight of gold, as well as the fact that not only is it not a particularly useful resource outside of, say, like electronics and jewelry, it's in. Right. I mean, aside I mean, from the history, something gold like gold. I mean, just like much that makes gold useful. Just something like day. a sound money, i.e., something which is a general medium of exchange. Why we? Why should we accept fiat money, which is constantly going to be inflating in price? You know, where it's going to have constantly redu reduced um, fucking uh, purchasing power. Why should we expect that to become the natural currency, rather than something like gold, which basically everybody wants gold. I mean, the case of gold is more of an outdated sense of value. I uh, ver no, it, no 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 it's it's, it's, not... it's it's not outdated. It's that the state supplanted gold with fiat through fraud. It committed fraud by making it, gold it committed fraud. Like it basically said, okay, right, all the cent all the banks have to store their gold reserves in the central bank now. And then after a while they're like, okay, right, now these now the individual banks are no longer allowed to withdraw those gold reserves anymore. They have to use uh, fiat now. That is fraud. They basically stole a bunch of fucking gold. How is that theft of gold? How is it not theft? They, they forced through the barrel of a gun all the banks to move their gold into the central bank and then said, right, you're not allowed to take this gold out anymore and, you know the banks went along with it because it allowed them to get in on the state's counterfeiting cartel but the 
reason that they went ahead and moved all the gold around and then they ultimately decided that the fiat would not only make sense but people actually went ahead with this change wasn't out of oh suddenly the state has all the gold or whatever it was more of a practical thing yeah, what, of, what was oh, the practical gold. benefit of having the state uh, have all the gold and we move to fiat what was the practical benefit of that one of the big things is that uh, back in the day it was a decent method of preventing massive collapses of currency having temporarily uh you know stopping people from withdrawing uh during times of economic crisis which would have had devastating consequences for local economies and so the institutions would go ahead and temporarily close up shop even back in say like the london uh bubble because back in the day I mean, this is this is uh, sounding a whole lot like you know, uh, there's booms and busts, so we need to prevent people from taking money out during uh, bank runs, which will have the bust. But I mean, this is a very Keynesian way of looking at the business cycle. The business cycle is caused by artificial credit expansion, by the fact that we have fiat currency. You can't have this artificial credit expansion under sound money. But you did before. Uh we started moving towards fiat just not to the same extent no no you you didn't have the business cycle before fiat it's not possible before fiat it just can't happen because the business but cycle it... has to be a result of uh, artificial credit expansion if you have natural credit expansion then you have economic growth not a boom in the boom bust sense but you had multiple of these situations, say, in Rome, they had the coins of various materials that would change in value significantly depending on uh, who's, uh, I need to I need to get down what exactly you mean by value pay. here, because value surely is subjective. So whose value you, of these coins is changing? You could say the purchasing power, you could say the perceived value, because it wasn't particularly valuable outside of Rome. You could say oh, the prices of everything have suddenly become askew, whether it's in terms of, say, uh, food becoming scarce, and suddenly, well, you need to spend a lot more on it, versus, oh... Uh, right, and you you should you know, have to spend a lot more on it. That's the point. Money is supposed to communicate something. It's not, it's not just this arbitrary metric, which you can change at will. It's communicating information. If food becomes a whole lot more scarce, then it should cost a whole lot more. You don't think that the price of food should be at least somewhat stable for, say, the it, security it of the, the population? The price of food should be exactly what it is on the free market. That's how much the price of food should be. Like, the, it, anything be else is an artificial economic. oversupply or undersupply of food. If you artificially set the price of food lower than it really should be on the free market, then you're having people are going, they're just not going to produce any food at that price because they can't make money out of it because it's more scarce. And do you not see the problem with a bunch of people suddenly not making food anymore because the price went too low? I mean, what is, what is the alternative? Enslave them? Force them to make food? You can have governmental and local policies that supplant them by providing them with uh, a certain amount of money to either produce for providing them that money price, from where or though you can have them from where uh, though produce... there are scarce means. Where are they providing these extra means to make more food from? You can have it has to be a reallocation. Of... Who is losing out in this reallocation? Well, it depends on the situation. For example, if uh, the banks are having issues, then they would receive a large amount of uh, funds to assist them. And say, if farmers are having problems, they should receive some aid. Right, or but say, then everybody uh, else has to be losing out. Are having issues. Right? Where are they taking these means from for them to continue making more food, we'll say? Where are they getting these means from? Because it has to come from somewhere. Well, the primary thing would be that there would be a certain uh, stockpile in the reserve of the state that they can draw from in times of crisis. Right, but where did they and get all that, of this from? And then it slowly increases in supply from the printing of more money. 
and then that can distribute through right so it's all it's all from their the banking state. monopoly but how did they acquire this banking monopoly it's a political process more than anything i agree that it's a political process political in the uh, oppenheimer sense of the term it's very political in that sense right and they are essentially aggressing against people to get this monopoly it's not just arbitrary they didn't just people didn't just decide to start using fiat money because why on earth would you decide to use that as a general medium of exchange it's going to go down in fucking value over time but it's, it it's, only it's gonna it's gonna have less so much per year but it's gonna have less purchasing power over time why would you use that instead of something like gold well with fiat there's a lot of uh practical benefits over say you know gold. what, what are the practical you, you benefits of fiat over something gold -based? Use it as a standard of value how can you more easily use it because instead of say oh uh you know i have this burden of barely being able to move it because it's so heavy and there's not many uses of it oh uh, it's you could it's use paper. you could just it's use very you could just use paper receipts for an amount of gold you could just use that now is that and problem solved instantly we exactly checks, we did for a while but, but then uh, uh you know fucking nixon came in and said no these paper receipts no longer correspond to gold so what is the practical benefit there the issue was both logistical as well as practical because with the checking you have to constantly ensure that it's actually backed by anything uh you also have to do that know. with well you have to actually check there's a real fiat note in any case there's always going to be counterfeiting but with fiat it, the counterfeiting is inherent the fiat counterfeiting is easier to identify because the government puts in these unique uh numbers on their dollars and they put the low kind of kind of uh, free market not in. put unique numbers no. on notes like this let's, let's just let's just go actually let's just go back to the beginning here so we have gold-backed currency what is the actual problem with gold-backed currency the issue is that gold isn't really a good indication of anything on top of all the logistical problems with gold i mean it's, a, it's a general medium of exchange it, you have to process it okay you have to put why does any of why is any of that a problem though just to have this bulky heavy but why uh, is that a that problem practical uses but why it's not it, it good... has plenty of practical uses or else it wouldn't arise as a general medium of exchange why are any to, of these things a problem with gold in the modern day it doesn't really have many uses outside of making very specialized parts of electronics and making jewelry if it doesn't have any specialized if it doesn't have any uses it won't be accepted as a general medium of exchange my point is we just have to have some sort of general medium of exchange which comes out of the free market whatever that may be seashells salt silver gold whatever it seems like gold is what people generally go for so I'm using gold as the example. So what is the actual problem with gold as the currency, as the money? Uh, again, it's a high investment, low return medium of exchange, which isn't very easy to work with. You have to take it out of the ground. You have to smelt it. You have to refine it. But why are these things a problem? And all these other things that why are these things a problem? That you're putting in a bunch of work for basically nothing when it be you're not getting nothing you're getting a bar go of gold you're getting a bar of gold like and now you can say i'll hold on i am now holding my bar of silver that i've got it's not gold but you know it's the same point i'm now holding my bar of silver this took a whole lot of effort to get out of the ground and to refine and to make mm -hmm. into a nice little 500 gram bar of silver right and i can now trade this i can just give this to somebody who wants 500 grams of silver if we were in a free market maybe it would be the case that silver would be the general medium of exchange and i could just say hey i've got 500 grams of silver how many cows does that get me or something like that right You're i could say things like this barting system at that point it's not the barter system because i'm not i'm not directly consuming this silver I am, it's indirect 
exchange. It's not direct exchange. I'm not directly exchanging, I don't know, beer for cows. I'm exchanging instead silver for cows. I'm not directly consuming this silver. I'm instead keeping this in hopes that I can further exchange it down the line. But that is the point in of indirect exchange. But that is the yeah. oh my that is the point of indirect exchange that you aren't gen you aren't directly consuming it. It's that is the whole point of indirect exchange that it isn't something that you are directly consuming and you have to find this double coincidence of once. I know that basically everybody will want fi some silver. Everybody can use silver because they know that they can exchange it down the road. This is the point of indirect exchange. But. No one actually, aside from, say, like, oh, uh, emergency apocalypse preppers and, oh, you know, the issue of press. You're, des you're like describing the problem keep... created by the state, not a problem inherent in using precious metals as a currency. Again, it's a higher amount of work to actually make it. Which is good. Which is which is good. It's you don't have this minutes. inflationary problem because I know that people can't just fucking uh, print out a bunch of silver to create a bunch of fucking silver. So I know it'll retain its exchange value. I know it will be basically the same amount of value in exchange ten years down the line. Right? It'll be a little bit less. It'll have. It'll command a little bit less of what it could today because there'll be a little bit more silver mined but i'm fine with that i'm not fine with storing 500 grams of silver worth of any fiat currency because i know it'll be inflated to shit i know i'll lose all my fucking money that and, is the point of a general medium of exchange and if you have money that you know is going to lose value what are you going to do with that money to prevent you losing that value i'm, I'm going to fucking turn it into fucking silver that's what I'm going to do. That's what I did and... do. That's what I did do. Because I knew my pound sterling would inflate massively, so I turned it into 500 grams of silver. Because I know this will retain its value over time. Okay, you personally bought a bunch of silver, knowing that the dollar is going to lose some value. And that's cool. You can, right. You can so, do what that. is the, the problem with silver-based currency then? What is the what is the problem with sound it's money? Going to slowly use value, and they can take that money, and they can spend it on entertainment, or they can spend it on trying to make a business venture, whatever. And because the dollar perpetually decreases in value ever so slightly, more in times of crisis or whatever, uh, that's fine. Like. That, that's a driving force behind human activity on top of the fact that people have needs and wants. It's a intent, It's an integral part of driving uh, activity and causing growth. That's fine. Good, even. Right, so what is the problem with this as a general medium of exchange? The silver in and of itself and gold and what have you doesn't actually increase in terms of you know the amount you have there's limits to it as a currency as the population grows again you have to put a ton of work into getting it and it doesn't actually this is all good activity. things these are all good things why are these bad value. things no one has any incentive to actually go ahead and oh work they have them. an incentive if they want to trade things if i want to go and i don't know uh buy a bunch of fucking beer right now i know there's if i was in a free market there'd be somebody who'd be willing to accept this silver if we were on a silver backed money if if silver was the money under a free market it would probably be gold but you know if it was silver then i know there'd be somebody willing to accept the silver this is the point of indirect exchange and you're suddenly having this significantly reduced market where no no you're having massive expanded market because if i let's say we're in the, the the base exchange market we're having crusoe friday let's let's not even have crusoe on friday we're having people a through z on an island just every letter of the alphabet is on this island and they're doing shit and then they're like a wants to trade his berries uh he's got a bunch of berries and he needs to get some cows. He needs to find somebody who has cows who wants berries. 
he needs to find that person. But if instead, they are all using a general medium of exchange, say, silver, then he only needs to exchange his berries for some silver. So all he needs to do is find somebody who wants berries and has silver. And he goes, all right, you have silver? I'll give you my berries for that silver. And then he goes to the person with cows and they'll want silver as well. So he gives him his silver that he now has for the cows. It's indirect exchange rather than direct exchange. This is so key in economics. It's so fucking key. And there's nothing inherently wrong with using it's, it, but again, it's, it's just natural. It's, it's, not it's as the natural. Or, as using, it's it's uh, money arises on really the market. On. We don't need to That's use. We don't need to have the state right. give us money. Money arises naturally. These this indirect medium of exchange arises naturally on the market. And again, this money isn't ideal. It's just... What's what's oh, not ideal about this? What is not ideal about this? Again, silver is inherently based on how much you can go ahead and get out of the ground. It's oh not... God, that's good. That's good. It's good that you can't massively inflate the supply of this shit. It's good. That is a good thing. Uh, obviously, hyperinflation is bad, but having a low, steady amount... What is wrong about that? What is bad about that? Again, it doesn't drive activity. The money what do you mean doesn't drive itself, activity? Oh my god, you're such a Keynesian. You're such a Keynesian, dude. You're going to have significantly more people going out and finding a way to go ahead and spend their money because they know it's going to go ahead and decrease in value and that will cause Right, even right, more that is overspending. Money. That is another part of the boom-bust cycle. You are such a Keynesian right now, dude. You are describing that let's let's just flood a bunch of money in and you know we'll have all this malinvestment and overspending and but what what row that caused the boom bust cycle. That is a problem. That is the you are describing the problems of fiat, but you're selling them as if they're good things. But Aren't they good things having a boom bust cycle? No, it's not a good thing to have a boom bust. You can have significant growth, and then in oh. times of uh, oh my god, in times dude. of oh my god, the people going ahead and seeing that the you know returns aren't as good, and then suddenly uh, oh right, I'm gonna going I'm so gonna well, give you an analogy right now. Activity again, where people will correct and. I'm just gonna, like I want to, I want to give you, I want to uh, give you an analogy well, we for the boom for, bust cycle right now. Out. I want to give you an analogy here. So basically, imagine Robinson Crusoe wakes up. He's he's been on this desert island for a while. He wakes up one day, comes out of his little hovel, and he sees some new colorful mushrooms on the ground. They grew overnight, and he's like, "Ah, oh, those are some interesting mushrooms." He eats these mushrooms, and they cause him to hallucinate. The hallucination is specific in that it makes him think that he has a far greater supply of goods than he did previously. So, you know, he would obviously change his plans of production. He'd go, wow, I've got so many goods. Instead of creating a tiny little raft, I'm just going to create a fucking cruise ship with robot butlers who are going to do everything for me. And I'm instead of creating a tiny little hut for myself, I'm going to create a mansion. I'm going to do all these crazy production plans because he has... He thinks he has so many goods, but he doesn't have these goods, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but then the, the, the hallucinations wear off. He wakes up the next day and he's like, oh, shit, I have misinvested all my goods. I have malinvested all of my goods in these projects, which I'm never going to be able to finish. I'm not going to be able to finish this cruise ship. I'm not going to be able to finish this mansion. He is, you know, your solution here. The Keynesian solution is, well, he should just eat more mushrooms. Now will get the boom started again. He'll think he has so much more goods, and he'll start investing them as such. No, no, no. The Austrian solution is, the bust is healing. That is when people are realizing that they have made wrong investments, and they are starting to make right investments again. What you're suggesting is that Crusoe should just eat more mushrooms, and then that'll solve all his problems. No, it won't because he'll still be misallocating resources. But you can realize that you're misallocating resources and then go ahead and make course adjustments and also have that steady inflation of 
supplies. No, 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 no. You're, 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 if you're having the steady inflation, inflation of supplies, you're constantly distorting the information mechanism, the information transfer mechanism that is money. You're constantly distorting the money, which is the entire point of money is a, it communicates information. But it doesn't in itself have to not only communicate information, it can also be a driver of people going no, no, no. ahead and you, you, making this, great this, changes this for drive, projects this, and this, this, this idea of life. driving investment, that is overinvestment, or rather malinvestment, I should say. You are thinking that you're making people think that m the price signals are different to how they are, so they're investing wrongly. They are investing in the wrong things, in things that they shouldn't be investing in. And will it somehow make it so that people don't ever make mistakes if you aren't? No, no, it will, it, will, it will make it that you won't have these clustered mistakes. That is the that is the essence of the boom bust cycle. That you have clustered malinvestment. It you obviously all the time entrepreneurs are making bad investments. They are always malinvesting. But these bad entrepreneurs who are making these bad investments will naturally get weeded out of the of the market because they will lose their money and they all go into a different line of fucking work, right? They won't be entrepreneurs anymore. They might uh, get a job at McDonald's or whatever. They won't be entrepreneurs is the point. So, you, But you have this clustered malinvestment when you have the business cycle because the price signals are all distorted. You have the general medium of exchange is being distorted in some way, which is making people not able to make the right investments. There's a difference between not able and a significant portion of people falling for basically bad information. Right, but if 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 we don't have this bad information in the first place, if we don't if we have sound money instead of fiat money, where well, you can't have this manipulation of price signals, that's surely better. I mean, it depends on the situation. In most cases, I would say that it's probably gonna drive more activity and otherwise be a good thing as people continually have that drive on top of their but inherent human all right. needs to actually this is the problem. and get rid of their activity currency. as such isn't necessarily good you can have overspending you can have too much activity in a market it wouldn't be good if everybody right now went out and spent their life savings on orbies or whatever that would be a whole lot of economic activity but it wouldn't be the right amount of activity it would be too much activity because everybody's investing in Orbeez, and then suddenly, you know, fucking, uh, we can't use these Orbeez to eat. You know, all the former farmers have lost their crop because they spent all their fucking money on Orbeez. You know, the it would be a whole lot of economic, GDP would go way up, right? There's there's actually a comic which goes into this. It's, um, you know, uh, Krugman and some other fucking idiot uh, economist. He go, he's, he's walking down, they're walking down, they see a pile of cow shit. Person A says to person B, hey, if you eat that uh, pile of cow shit, I'll give you 10 grand. And he's like, deal. And he eats that pile of cow shit. Then they're further in the road. Person B says to person A, hey, if you eat that pile of cow shit, I'll give you 10 grand. And he says, deal. And he eats that pile of cow shit. And, uh, you know, uh, they're they're walking further down. Person B says, you know, uh, we both ate cow shit. Oh, neither of us are richer. Uh, and then person A says, don't worry, bro. Uh, GDP has just increased by 20 grand and we make create two new jobs. It's it's fine. Right, you see the problem there. It's, it's just having more economic activity isn't necessarily the this necessary It's not good. a it's not a golden bullet. Right, yeah. It's just it's just not necessarily a good thing. You can have overspending. You can have too much activity is my point. Yes, you can, and that's a time when you don't follow Keynesian policies. Right, that, but that you, should be always, you should never follow Keynesian policies. Because it's always going to be the case that you are distorting the market away from what it should be. But what should the market be? The market should be exactly what the free market makes it. 
Uh, uh, again, like, it, it's not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, if you just have a nat, quote unquote, natural activity with no intervention from any overarching organizations, you're going to have a lot of trends that don't necessarily better anyone, just like you're also going to have these booms it, well, and busts. It necessarily has to better at least the easy. people who are trading, right? Because trade has necessary mutual profit. Most does, yeah. Not most. All trade, all voluntary trade, that is, has necessary mutual profit. No, because people don't always follow their self-interests, and a lot of well, people are just well, flat-up consumers. You, can you give me a counterexample of a voluntary trade where both parties do not profit? Both parties don't profit, or one party doesn't profit? Well, at least one party doesn't profit. Okay, let's say that the current state of consumerism where people just buy these, uh, what do you call them, Funko Pops. Mm -hmm. They're just these little fucking plastic things. They don't do anything. You don't get any entertainment value out of them, but people still spend money on them because of, like, oh, I don't know, collector's value or something. They're not actually getting anything out of it, but people will willingly fork over hundreds of dollars for these. Right, and, and the, the fact... nothing happens with them. The Except fact... for the seller the, the makes some fucking plastic. The fact that they fork over hundreds of dollars surely implies that they value the Funko Pop more than the hundreds of dollars that they fork over, right? And they're fools for it. Nothing is actually Okay, right, but they, they, they surely it. have to value it more than the money they pay for it. They surely do. Right. And so they, they, they get something good. that they get something that they value more. Ergo, they raise themselves on their value scale, so they profit. It it was a meaningless exchange you you might think so but they don't think so they necessarily have to think so that they necessarily have to think that they value whatever they're getting more than what they're giving up for whatever reason it might be something that you think is a silly reason but they have to think that so they have to profit and do you not see the issue with people going ahead and just buying whatever because I mean, of their personal I, perception going, i agree i agree oh my god that's such a great thing i i agree that it's silly but that is irrelevant to economic analysis whether you think it's silly or whether i think it's silly is completely irrelevant to whether they do profit but they do profit so you're basically just saying that personal gratification is just a fine means to an end. I'm saying that when you raise yourself on your value scale, you are profiting. And you necessarily have to raise yourself on your value scale when you exchange something that you value less for something that you value more, which is the case in every voluntary exchange. So therefore, every voluntary exchange has mutual profit a priori and that doesn't actually necessarily create like anything what do you mean so it doesn't create you're anything. basically just having I mean, of course uh, of course trade doesn't create anything you just me hopping it doesn't create anything but what's your point we've fallen into a trap of just like how you have a boom and bust suddenly Oh, uh, things are fine. People are just buying whatever, even if they're not actually going ahead and, you know, creating anything of mer uh, metrical value. They're not, say, uh, improving the quality of life or, uh, you they know, necessarily, if building they, if they're a nicer house or if, whatever. If they're trading it, then it's necessarily creating a better quality of life for those who they're trading it towards. It has to be the case. Or else the and other trade partner wouldn't agree to it. This is essentially falling into the rut that is the current state of American consumers. I mean, the necessary. What was your actual response to this argument, it's, though? Rather than just saying consumers, 
over and over it's just again. Decadence. There's no actual. Okay, right. But what's your actual response? You can be offended by all you want. Advancement. You can be. Or, you can be uh, offended you know, by it all you fucking want. But what is the actual response to this argument that they do profit? You. You're basically just changing what it means to profit. So I'm not changing not it anything. Is actually profitable. Just. What do you Doesn't think profit matter. is then? You can be what do you a think profit is? Loss, and it just doesn't matter at that point. What do you think profit is? If not, if uh, not raising yourself on your value scale, if value is not subjective, what is your theory of value? There isn't any inherent value in anything. It's right. If there's not the in, in, in any inherent value yeah. in anything, then it has to be subjective, right? Again, it it is, but right, that's not it is subjective. Good, so therefore, as so therefore, we have the subjective theory possible. of value. So therefore, mutual exchange, voluntary mutual exchange, has mutual profit. But at that point, nothing actually happens again. What like, do you mean nothing happens? We have exchange. We have the division of it's labor. It's a meaningless exchange. What do you mean you, you meaningless? You can go on and on about how, oh, uh, you know, we're, we're making it so that everyone benefits, but at the end of the day, they're not actually doing anything. What do you mean not doing it? There is clearly production going on of a good that people want to consume. And right. they're just consuming because it makes them feel good or whatever. Yeah, that is what everybody does. Everybody consumes everything because they, it makes them feel good. That's what consumption is. And it's just pointless. Like, Okay, right, let's, let's say they have a fucking religious uh, of, attachment uh, to their fucking fungal pops. Would that make it alright then? No, it's, it's, it's the fact that everybody consumes everything they consume because it makes them feel better. That's the, what consumption is. And we should probably go ahead and get rid of that. Get so get rid of exchange. No, I'm saying get rid of the decadence. You want to make sure that okay. How do you measure decadence? They understand how how do you doing measure decadence just for the sake of gratification isn't actually getting you anywhere. How do you measure decadence? It's just luxury goods. So like, what makes a good a luxury good? If it's not necessary for survival. So any good not necessary for survival is a luxury good. Why are you currently using a computer? For entertainment. This is all right, that a bunch is, that of... Is, uh, that is not necessary for survival, my friend. So uh, uh, abide by your own teachings and shut up and log off and never use a computer ever again. There, I should. Right, yeah, do it right now. Sure. Go on. All right. If I ever see you on a computer again, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> uh, but the point being, it, it's all just for the sake of entertainment. We're going yeah, down a path of which is, no which return. Is not we're destroying for, the environment all for the that sake is, of... That is, oh, not, getting that is not for the point of survival, though. You said you should only ever use a good, which is for the point of survival. You're currently not we doing this for survival. In an ideal world. Oh, so, it, it, so you think it's fine to use things in a non-ideal world. But you could currently, Me. right now, stop using a computer. You could log yeah. off, you could shut up, you could never tell anybody about your fucking retard doctrines ever again. You could do that right now. Yeah, I could. Right, so why don't you? I dislike the current way that we're heading and I want to try and course adjust. But why? Why bother? Because you have to use these evil means to do so. They're far from evil so much as they're just incredibly undesirable but if they're Where... undesirable then you that's clearly a contradiction because you desire to use them it's a means to an end right and it's a means which you are deeming undesirable but you desire to use it what where is where am i slipping up there why is that not a it's contradiction? It's a compromise it's a contradiction is what it is yeah it's it's a compromise. It's it's a an contradiction. For the sake of a contradiction goal. is not the same word as compromise. You're having a contradiction here in saying that it is an undesirable means, and yet you desire it. 
Clearly. But I, I don't desire the means itself. I desire my end goal, and I use the means to you, you desire, get towards you, that de end you goal. desire the utilization of this means, and yet you claim it is an undesirable means to utilize. And I, I would rather just not have these electronics and all these other things Clearly going not. On. Clearly not. Because if you did desire to not have any of this going on, then you wouldn't be doing any of this. You would be out in the fucking wilderness. If you did truly desire the opposite. I would, I would opposite. love to be out in the middle of nowhere, but then I can't go. for various practical reasons. Then, then, then stand up and walk out your fucking house right now. I would absolutely love to just live in the middle of nowhere with clearly, a cabin in the woods, a family clearly, and all that. Clearly you but love it no. more to not do that. Are you, like, blind to the fact that people have expenses and things that tie them to where they are. I'm, I'm not blind to any of that. Uh, I completely agree that y you have all these things that you love about modern life and that you would much rather stay in modern life. I completely agree. But I embrace that fact. You don't. You are ashamed by your modern life. And that is truly shameful. Ashamed of modern life? You are clearly ashamed by your modern life. And that is the shameful thing about you. In what way is disliking the status quo and wanting to live a more simplistic it's, and it's, more based on it's the fact that you project uh, ideological? It's aspect. the fact that you project this aura that you it is distasteful to engage in all these modern luxuries. You even said it yourself. The fact that you project this that it's distasteful to engage in these. And yet you still engage in them. That is what makes you ashamed of your modern living. You shouldn't be ashamed of this. You should be happy about it. You should be thrilled by the fact that you have this modern living. But it's just... There, there's no greater point to it. And so... The it greater really point is, is the furtherance of human. Undesirable. The greater point is the furtherance of human welfare, which is the point of a capital good. You are a primitivist. No. You are absolutely a primitivist. You hate humans, is what it is. Primitivism mm, is anti human, no. it is an anti ethic. No. It absolutely is. What is what is the response, though? You can say no all you want, but what is the response? You're basically just throwing out a label and saying that I believe X, Y, Z when I don't. Ethics is how to live your life well. That is the point of ethics. At primitivism is how to live your life worse. That is what makes it an anti-ethic. What is your response? There is no actual... There's no actual. There is no I, I response. I don't know how to articulate this because it's just so contradictory to how we have lived for hundreds of years, uh, where we have a very straightforward system of we have our needs, we act as a collective to solve our needs. And when we have conflicts with other people, we either I'm sorry act act as a collective. I think you them through I think you introduced yourself saying that you were quite libertarian leaning, but then you just said act as a collective. You can have libertarian leanings, but also be a nationalist. I mean, what does it mean to act as a collective? There are many different ways in which you can do that. You can band together as a people, whether it be. Uh, you know, through common discourse, or you can go ahead and create a political party. Is that not just a bunch of a individuals of acting, or what though? Have you. Surely that's just a set of individuals who are each acting. Why is that a collective acting? Because you act for a common goal. Right, but what does that make and it that the collective is acting? The collective you're isn't a common goal. Means. You're acting... It's together. just a bunch of individuals. It's not as if it's like 20 people that happen to work together. You. It absolutely is. 20 people who happen to work together. They happen to coalesce on this goal, and they happen to agree to, you know, 
uh, pool their resources maybe in some way. And that is, that is not collective action. There? That is still individual action. It's still a bunch of individuals acting. It's still individual action. It's still human action, I should say. You know, you're a ha you're an anti-human, so you wouldn't understand human action. Mm, but I'm not. I'm very much pro things I mean, if, about... If, if you're pro-human, um, you know, why are you so anti-capital goods? There's no actual greater benefit to anyone involved it's just there uh, is a greater benefit to the people who think they'll have a greater benefit but is for there the necessarily is a greater benefit to implementation of higher order capital goods necessarily the case but this isn't going anywhere this isn't say oh we're creating this beautiful thing uh like a you know a lush forest or uh you know a great architectural achievement it's a good Not right only so it, it's it's good it's harm, good it's good it's good that you don't like creating very but other people benefit. Like. this is just you projecting your own preferences upon the world and now i ask you what makes your preferences so fucking special my preferences being special yeah what makes your preferences so special the what, what aspect of it you're, you're getting a little annoyed there about the fact that, well, all these other people are having their own preferences met and they're, like, they're disgusting, degenerate pre preferences. But my preferences are so cool and neat and holy. But what makes your preferences so special that they should be the standard by which civilization should be organized? The fact that they're actually... Uh practical means to an end whether it's in the form what of what makes them practical housing it, it, i literally just said housing and you're saying what makes what makes what? You, define what makes your preferences practical as opposed to other preferences the means they cause you're if it's a house or if it's food or water or something like uh, air conditioning or heating or what have you, that very directly benefits the people who use them. It's, it's. I mean, if we're talking about direct benefits, of every good and then they can go ahead and flourish. Every good necessarily benefits those who are consuming the good. Has to. That's what it means to be a good. So just like a, a book benefits for person who's reading it or mm -hmm. a tv show benefits for person who watches it yep it's just an expression of again want they're not actually getting anything outside of it aside from dopamine like but you, they are you benefiting well just from inject it. yourself with the chemical they, at that point there's no meaningful difference they necessarily i mean if if they had the option of injecting dopamine maybe they would choose that and then they would necessarily benefit from it Could you repeat that? If they did have the option of injecting dopamine, maybe they would choose that and they would benefit from it. We know heroin addicts exist, after all. And do you not see the problem with that, where it's people just doing things for their basal well, instincts of... Oh, uh, it makes me feel good. There's a there's a conflation here, I think, with um, you know, maybe a moral panic problem that you might have with something, as opposed to a legal problem. There is no legal problem with somebody injecting themselves with heroin, but there is, uh, you know, I think it is detrimental to their future well-being. So I would I would want to encourage people to not do heroin, but we can encar we can do this on a purely moral basis. We don't have to say that, therefore, heroin should be prohibited. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with a, a drug, but if you're doing something just for the sake of it, you're not only wasting these resources, but again... What do you mean wasting? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I just need to push you on... What does it mean to waste a resource there? Because they are using these resources. They're using them towards their own ends, and they clearly own these resources. So what is the problem there? 
why are they wasting them? The matter of a fact is that we have significant harm already done to the environment as well as ever aspects of the world we live in whether it ranges from pollution to smog that is for almost the sole sake of creating oh a, a battery which in some cases has very good uses but overwhelmingly it's for like oh uh, a gps or oh uh, an electronic uh or whatever it's causing this harm again that's going to come back and bite us sooner or later and we're using it instead on something that not only again is for our enjoyment which inherently is temporary based on how the human brain works but we're also going to actually go ahead and use up these things whether it's uh, a book it'll slowly corrode from wear and tear or oh, if it's uh electronic it'll slowly slowly uh, fall apart plastic will fall apart and you'll get microplastics in the environment that animals will eat and will eventually get into people but we're continually going on even further and causing even more environmental harm leading towards the climate catastrophe we're shooting ourselves in the foot I'd like to go I'd like you to go over exactly what it means to do harm to the environment. We're putting our chemical waste products into the rivers and the oceans. We're massively overfishing for the sake of creating things like say a sushi, which are uh massive uh expenditures of labor for very limited amounts of food. And we're causing massive ripple effects from deforestation. We're planting more than ever. And all these other things that have consequences in the environment. We're producing more CO2 than ever, which uh, continually heats up the planet. We're causing extinctions of various species, such as the dodo bird. And things like the giraffe even are going on the extinction list or they're in extreme danger. Uh, and that's going to eventually cause a collapse of the entire ecosystem, which will kill everybody. So because, you're again. So you're like a uh, final worry here is that it will kill everybody. That's one of the eventual consequences of everything that's going to happen. Right. Uh, I mean, um, you know, how couldn't this be solved through private property rights, right? You know, let's say chemicals and water. That, that was one of the things you mentioned. Right. If I own a river, there's clearly no problem me polluting that, polluting that river. If I own a fishery, there's clearly no problem me fishing through that fishery however fucking much I want. Right, uh, how would any of this lead to the death of everybody? Or even the death if, of anybody? If people are constantly destroying the environment because they happen to own it, then that's going to, regardless of whether or not you work with everybody, if people are behaving on this basis, that's going to have serious consequences. I mean, this is, this is, this is why I told you that you are anti-human. You're favoring the environment over humans here. Humans want to modify you the environment, favor... and you're saying, and you're saying they're Life. bad for wanting to modify the environment towards their own ends. This is anti-human. This is anti-action. This is evil in the very basal definition of the term. Evil. You are wanting to restrict what humans can do, and you're wanting to lead to human death, just so that the environment can survive. What the fuck does we, that mean? You. This is the most evil the thing. This is the most... Exactly. But that is saying that we require it so that humans can survive. But you're saying that humans should not be allowed to inv change the environment because it's evil towards the environment. It's, it's mean to the environment. It's hurting the environment. No, 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 no. We should have the environment subservient to humans. That is true environmentalism. Humans are part of the environment. Do you not see how that's going to have severe consequences and how that's going to harm if everybody? It, if it does, 
then we have these arbitration processes, right? We have it that, you know, if it's uh, going to be harmful to somebody else, we have these private property rights. We have private property to deal with disputes over the environment. We don't have it that the environment is superior to humans in how the environment should be dealt with. That makes no fucking sense. And in what way are we going to solve these problems for arbitration? In the way that we can have an objective property right in every single thing in the environment. Privatize everything which moves, privatize everything which doesn't move. That's what we should do. The thing which you advocate for would be not much different from anarchy. That's why I'm an anarchist. I thought you said you were an ANCAP, which is an anarcho-capitalist. It's. I wonder what the anarcho different... stands for there. Actually, I, I, I have an idea. It might stand for an anarchist. Oh, yes, it's an anarcho-capitalist, which is a type of anarchist. You're valuing Who knew? money over everything. I'm valuing and money over everything. You... you need to read up on an ANCAP, bro. I'm not valuing money over everything. What the fuck does that even mean? What does it mean to value You're money over everything? The very means by which you live over everything. And also, I... When I was Bro, we had this debate planned weeks in advance. Did you not like look at a single one of my videos? Conflate, I wasn't trying to conflate anarcho capitalism with anarchy. I was saying that you're not much different. I am. From an, them do conflate what, it. Do conflate it. It is the same thing. Anar okay, right. Anarcho capitalism. The capitalism there just means. Can you stop Austri interrupting me when I'm trying to the, go on a the capitalism to explain something that you blew the, up in me like not even ten seconds? The, cap on? the capitalism there just means Austrian economics. It doesn't mean anything else. It's it's anarchism with Austrian economics. Like, could you? Oh my god! Yeah, do you know what argumentation you, ethics is? Not much about it. Do you want to go over argumentation ethics if we're gonna get deep into econ here? Sure. So, um, whenever we are engaging in an argument, we have these normative presuppositions. Would you agree with that? We very much do. Right, and uh, you know. So we couldn't argumentatively dispute such normative presuppositions, right? Probably not, no. I'm I'm worried by the term probably in there. Like, could there be a counterexample where you could argumentatively dispute, like, you know, something like, uh, I don't know, um, it is, you should never ever argue. Could you argue something like that? You, you could, but it would be a very, very awkward conversation in which one person is trying to go ahead and be logically consistent, and the other person is derailing the entire thing. Right. I it, should it maybe, wouldn't be a I productive should, argument. I should, uh, that's why I use the term probably not, because you can argue, it's just that it wouldn't be a productive argument. Right. So I should maybe be like clear in what I mean here. It would be a contradiction to argue that, right? To argue that you should never argue. That would be a contradiction, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, so in the Hopper sense of argumentation, that would not be a true argumentation if you knew that this was a contradiction and thus a falsehood. You aren't truly arguing. If you were, if you were aware of this fact and you were trying to genuinely pre present it as an argument, you'd be contradicting yourself. So you're just babbling, essentially, right? So this this would be a position which is objectively false, that you should never argue. That would be an objectively false position, right? It would be inconsistent. The inconsistency is contradiction, right? Yeah. So, via the law of non-contradiction, we can say that this would be a false position, right? In almost any sense of the word, yes. 
Right, so this is a false position. There are some normatively false positions here. And, you know, similarly, we can say that, well, when we're engaging in an argument, we are having that we are not using violence to attack each other to try and get the other person to agree with our position. We're trying to just get them to agree through the force of our arguments rather than through the force of violence, right? Preferable, yes. Yeah, so therefore, violence is not a permissible move in an argumentation, right? We shouldn't be using violence for the sake of being correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, therefore, we have it that we have this dispute, this argumentative dispute, and necessarily, because we're engaging in an argument over this dispute, we are saying that violence is not the correct way to solve these disputes, right? Sure. Right, so because violence is not the correct way to solve disputes, we have the non-aggression principle. Okay. Right, and therefore, nobody could argue against the non-aggression principle. The only issue at that point is things that are objectively harmful to other people. Um, describe how in how exactly could somebody argue against the non-aggression principle? I.e., how could somebody argue for conflict initiation? If someone does something that is that is going to go ahead and harm someone else. Uh, but it's not direct, at what point do you draw the line and say that, oh, um, this isn't permissible to go ahead and, uh, you know, cause harm to them, knowing that they're going to cause harm to you, either directly or well, this indirectly. Is, this is the point with conflict initiation. That's why I say initiation there. If somebody were to start stabbing me, then yeah, I'd be allowed to stop them from stabbing me. But I'm not initiating the conflict there. They initiated the conflict by starting to stab me. They most assuredly did. Yeah. So it's the initiator of conflict. The point is that you couldn't argue in favor of conflict initiation. Okay. Right, so... Do do we agree that you could not argue for conflict initiation? As long as it's consistent that, you know, uh, you have these basic things that you don't cross the line on, then sure. Right, so then we have uh, the entirety of Rothbard in natural law. Ergo, no state. But the issue with that is the state in principle is something that is voluntary yeah what do you mean the state is something that is in principle voluntary because are you are you, are you going to be one of these randy and minarchists who thinks the state is voluntary this is this whole debate i've bro. never heard of randian so I, i'm not like a fury guy i'm just like this random guy who happens to believe that nationalism is generally good i'm not i'm not going to dive into some random 200 year old book and go like, oh, this is a great idea. Like, uh, when 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 I first agreed to go ahead and go online uh, with your call with whoever set this up, I, I put that very plainly. I'm I'm just a random guy. I'm not gonna go ahead and throw a book at you and say this is how things should be. I, no. So I mean, is your ideal state entirely voluntary? Then is yeah, it's just we're agreeing to this state right mm -hmm. okay so then i think um we perhaps have no further um point of contention here i i will just uh i'll send you my video on minarchist typology after this and you'll see oh. if you fit into the uh, randian minarchist type two two things from before uh, when I was saying that you're not functionally much different from just an anarchist, it was not saying that uh, anarcho-capitalism is an inherently invalid form of anarchism. 
I was saying that uh, by trying to mix the two of capitalism and anarchism, you're creating a system in which it is more likely to go one way or the other, where it's incredibly likely to go ahead and things would just devolve into pure anarchism or things would slowly converge towards uh, capitalism and then most yeah. likely even towards something like state capitalism where the uh, capitalist functions would essentially supplant the state only without the foundations of one. Here, Here's my point though, is that the capitalism in anarcho-capitalism just means Austrian economics, which is just what economic science, i.e. what economic school you ascribe to it, i am an anarcho-capitalist because i'm an anarchist who thinks that austrian economics is correct that's what okay. makes me an ancap okay so anyway I'll, I'll send you that video afterwards and it's been great talking to you bro do you have anything else you want to say anything you want to plug or anything like that i'm not really a social media guy like i have them for the sake of the username so uh uh, uh, I'll see you later then, I guess. See ya. Bro, the whole time. The whole time. He's a fucking anarchist. Who knew? Yeah, I'll see you guys later. Uh, boop.